and love, then from God's perspective, it really adds up to nothing. This morning, we're going to begin our inspection of the various fruit of the Spirit as they're listed in Galatians 5. We've spent the last couple of Sundays providing some background for the fruit of the Spirit and an overview of the fruit. And uh, beginning this Sunday, for the next uh, several weeks, we're going to examine one by one each of the nine character traits that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in each of our lives as Christ's followers uh, with our cooperation. And today we are going to take a close-up look at uh, this first piece of fruit on the Apostle Paul's list, and it happens to be love. In the first place, love. This is highly significant because these pieces of fruit are not listed in random order. It's not like the Apostle Paul just started writing down various character traits. The fruit of the Spirit is, let me see, what should I put down? And he just listed them as they happen to come to mind. It isn't coincidental that love heads the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Paul deliberately placed love, first of all, because he truly believed it's the virtue that matters most. How do I know that? Well, how do I know that Paul considered love supreme? Well, the list of the Spirit's fruit isn't the only place in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul prioritizes love. There are numerous other places in his biblical letters that Paul elevates love above everything else. As you can see here, I've assembled a collage of New Testament verses which demonstrate the supremacy of love in Paul's spirit-controlled mind. First of all, in Romans 5, Paul writes, for, how, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with what? With his love. Paul is telling us here that when we first became a Christ follower and trusted him alone for our salvation, the Holy Spirit of God was given to us. And he took up residence in our life, and now he makes sure that God's love is personally felt deep inside of each of us like never before. Literally here, Paul writes that through the Holy Spirit, God's love is poured out into us. God doesn't leak or drip his love to us in tiny measures. He produces a flood of love into our hearts that is intended to fill us and then overflow into the lives of others. So a heart full of God's kind of love is the primary evidence that the Holy Spirit is present in our life. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5, the same chapter that contains the fruit of the Spirit, Paul says that the only thing that counts is faith in Jesus Christ expressing itself, how? Through love. That is, if the Christian faith is inside of us, it will be noticed and verified by the Christian love that comes out of us. Of all the virtues that Paul could have chosen to declare to be the distinguishing mark of a Christian, he picked love. Paul goes on in this same chapter, Galatians 5, to say that the entire law of God is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, there are 613 commands in the Old Testament law of God. And they can be condensed and summarized, Paul says, in in this way. Just love people. Treat those around you the way you would want to treat them. If you love people and love God, you are, in effect, obeying the hundreds of God's commandments. Paul considered love so supreme among all the virtues that in 1 Timothy, he identified the overall purpose of his entire teaching ministry, whether his instruction came in the form of speaking or writing. Paul says that the overall purpose of my teaching ministry is that all believers will be filled with love. Got to thinking about that this week as a preacher and teacher. Over the course of the last 30 years, I've delivered over 1,200 different sermons here at Village Church. And I've taught hundreds of classes as well. And really, that should be my goal, and hopefully has been my goal as well, that if you boil down all that I've said for 30 years, it comes down to this. People, come to Jesus so that you can love God and love people as you should. Here are just a few other strands of evidence supporting the supremacy of love in Paul's mind. In his first letter to the church in Corinth, he says, do everything in love. That pretty well sums it up, right? 
Whatever you do in life, do it in love. And then he devotes a whole chapter in this letter, 1 Corinthians 13, and it's an eloquent appeal for Christian love. And in it, at the end, he says, folks, Christian faith is essential. Folks, Christian hope is vital. But folks, the greatest, the greatest is love. And so all of us who follow Jesus should realize that we will never move beyond our obligation to love others. In fact, Paul writes in Romans 13, let no debt remain outstanding. Now that's interesting in light of where we've been as a congregation this past winter. Those of us who took Financial Peace University, the course, we, we were challenged to work hard at paying off all of our financial debts. But Paul reminds us here that there's another kind of debt that you and I will never repay. Love will forever remain an unpaid debt, a debt that we will always be working on, but we will never be working off. No matter how much we love others, we will always owe them more love. So looking at these excerpts from Paul's letters to churches, we shouldn't be surprised then that Paul heads the list of the fruit of the Spirit with love. Love should be in first place. In fact, the case can be made for the fact that, that Paul, in these verses listing the fruit of the Spirit, could have put a period after the word love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And just stopped right there. Instead of putting a comma, he could have just ended the list after naming only this one piece of fruit, and he would have been giving God's message to us. Actually, Martin Luther made this very observation, as you can see by the quote at the bottom of this next slide. In a message on the fruit of the Spirit, Luther declared, it would have sufficed to list only love, for this expands into all the fruit of the Spirit. Luther is saying that love is the source of all the other fruit. The rest of the other fruit flow out of love, for if you truly love God, you will experience joy and peace. And if you truly love people, you will be patient with them and kind and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled. Paul provides some interesting insight into the relationship between love and these other fruit in Colossians 3, where he talks about what the best-dressed Christians are wearing. Therefore, as God's chosen people, he writes, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Humility, gentleness, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. And patience, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, like any good teacher, Paul uses various metaphors or word pictures to illustrate the truth he was teaching. For instance, virtues that are the fruit of the Spirit that we should cultivate are also articles of clothing that we should wear. And Paul tells us in verse, verse 14 of Colossians 3 that if you think about all these virtues that we should be wearing as Christians, love is the top coat that coordinates the entire Christian wardrobe. He writes, over all these virtues, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is what you put on top of all of these other items of dress, Paul says, because as we live the Christian life, love is what ties everything together that we are and that we do. Do you want to be an attractive Christian? Well, then dress attractively. Clothe yourselves with things like joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But if you really want to be stunning, then enhance all these other virtues you are wearing by putting on the beautiful top coat of love. It's the main attraction. Okay, so we've established, I think, why love has to be first on the list of the fruit of the Spirit. So now we need to define what love is. We need to describe what Christian love looks like. And it is important to note that Paul uses a special word for love. Not only in his list of the Spirit's fruit, but also in every one of the other Scripture passages that I have shown you this morning. In the Greek language that Paul spoke and wrote, the distinctive word for Christian love, for God's kind of love, is agape. Paul uses the noun agape 75 times in his New Testament letters, and agape in verb form he uses 34 times. He's all about agape love, and so today's message focuses on agape love. I remember years ago when my two daughters were young and they were still growing up in our home, one Sunday I preached a similar message to this one. I was emphasizing what agape love is all about, and my daughters got into a tiff at home that Sunday just an hour or so after the morning service. 
And suddenly I heard my oldest daughter, Erin, deeply perturbed about something her little sister had just done to her, and she loudly exclaimed, Christian, Kristen, you should show agape love, you dork. <laughs> you know, it's so easy to apply sermons on love to someone else, mistakenly believing that they need it more than we do, but I would contend that we're all dorks. And none of us are as good at loving others as we might think we are. So perhaps the place to begin is probing for a deeper understanding of agape love. For the next few minutes, I want to analyze agape and suggest to you that it consists of the three essential components that you see before you now. Agape love is, first of all, unselfish serving. Secondly, agape love expresses itself even towards those who don't deserve it. In fact, this is a distinguishing mark of agape. It is especially eager to love those who are especially hard to love. And thirdly, agape love gives whatever is needed, no matter what the personal cost. Now, I want to invest a few minutes in each one of these components and enrich our understanding of this distinctively Christian love. First, agape love is unselfish serving. Note that serving is an action verb. Christian love is something that we do, not just something that we feel. Agape puts us in motion rather than just stirring an emotion. It certainly feels compassion for others, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with those feelings. It goes ahead and does something or gives something to help meet the needs of others. Romans 5.8 tells us that God showed his great love for us not just by feeling compassionate for us, but by doing something about it. He, he, he set in motion a plan to save us from sin and eternal death, and he did that by sending Christ to our rescue. God didn't just feel compassion for us, as I said. He did something to meet our desperate need. Agape love always shows itself in selfless action. So we should imitate God and love others the same way he does. We should love others with God's kind of love. And Paul reminds us that like God's love, our love for others shouldn't be selfish. It is not self-seeking. On the contrary, when we truly manifest Christian love, we will be serving one another humbly in love. Serving, it's action. It's putting into practice what you're saying, putting your money where your mouth is. It's at this point that I can't resist retelling one of my favorite stories. If you've been around Village Church for a few years, you have no doubt heard me tell this story before of a cement worker who, while, while laying new sidewalks in a subdivision, bragged to his co-workers one day about how much he loved children. But then when some kids in the neighborhood put their handprints in the newly poured sidewalks, this man, a self-proclaimed lover of children, went ballistic. He ranted and raved and described in detail what he was going to do to these kids. The other workers took note of this man's blustering overreaction, and they challenged him. Hey, I thought you said you loved children. And he replied, I do love kids in the abstract, but not in the concrete. <laughs> it's one thing to love people abstractly. It's, lo it's easy to love people in theory. It's quite another to love them concretely in real life and with real actions. In fact, the rest of the fruit of the Spirit are concrete expressions of agape in our daily attitudes and conversation and conduct. Agape love finds all sorts of active ways to serve other people unselfishly. You know, up, about, up to about seven years ago, I have to confess, and I'm not proud to say this, I had never donated blood in my life. I just don't like needles. I don't like the pain. I didn't like the inconvenience of it. But about seven years ago, um, my grandson was born three months premature, weighed one pound, 14 ounces, needed multiple blood transfusions, and it was determined that I had the same blood type as, as my new grandson. And folks, I was rolling up my sleeve on the way down the hallway to the room to give blood, gave blood several times and did it gladly. You know what? It's easy to love people and to serve them when you love them and when they deserve it. But the second component of agape love is its insistence on loving unlovely people. 
especially when they're at their most unlovable. Anyone can show love to people who deserve it. What sets agape apart is that it extends love even toward the undeserving. In this sense, agape love is unconditional. It gives regardless of the worthiness of the recipient. And again, God is a supreme example of agape. Back to Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love to us by sending Christ because we deserved it. Oh, no, while we were still sinners, Christ came. You know, if you want to boil down sin to its very essence, sin is saying to God, leave me alone. Sin is a declaration of independence. God, I don't need you. Some people say, leave me alone with a clenched fist. They're angry at God. Leave me alone. Most of us sin more respectably. We sin with an open palm. Leave me alone, God. Uh, Don't call me. I'll I'll call you if, if I need you. And we sometimes think of God like a flotation device on an airplane. It's nice to know that it's there, but we hope we are never gonna need it. That's sin. And despite our ugly rebellion against God and our disregard of him, God loved us anyhow. He loved us despite the fact that we were his enemies, despite the fact that we were nobodies in this world, and he keeps loving us despite the fact that we fail him again and again and again. And we show God's kind of love to others, Paul writes in the Bible, when we feed our enemies enemies if they are hungry, when we are willing to make friends with nobodies, and when we never give up on, we never lose faith in people who have disappointed us and failed us. Love endures through every circumstance. A missionary couple came home from the mission field for a year of furlough after an unusually tiring stint of service. And the wife in particular had been looking forward to this time of rest with with great anticipation. For for the first time, she was going to have a place of her own. It was a large new uh, townhouse-style condo with a patio. She was very creative and made the patio the focus of her decorative talents. However, after a few months of bliss, some new neighbors moved next door, and the word to describe them would be coarse. There was loud music day and night with a constant flow of obscenities. They urinated in the front yard in broad daylight. They totally disrupted her peace. She could see nothing good in them at all. She asked the Lord to help her to be more loving, but all she got back from these annoying neighbors was disgust and rejection. And the crisis came when she returned home one day to discover that her neighbor's children had sprayed orange paint all over her beautiful patio, the walls, the floors, and everything. She was distraught. She was furious. She tried to pray but found herself crying out, God, I cannot love them. I hate them. Knowing that she had to deal with the sin in her own heart, she asked the Lord to give her the power to love these seemingly unlovable people. And she sensed the Lord telling her to put love into action even though she didn't feel like it. So this is what she did. She made a list of what she would do for her neighbors if they were lovely people. And she really didn't like them. And then she started doing the list. She started baking cookies and offering to babysit for free. And she invited the mother over for coffee. And she lent things to them without expecting anything back. And a beautiful thing happened, as you can imagine. She began to know and understand them, how lost and empty their lives were. She began to see that they were living under tremendous pressures. And she began to feel love for them. Uh, That's what happens. When we show love, we begin to feel love. And when it was time for her to return to the mission field, she wept as she said goodbye to her former enemies who had now become new friends and had been drawn towards Jesus Christ. There is a person in your life, maybe you've been thinking about them all morning during this sermon, and you don't like them. You don't love them. They've hurt you. They disgust you, and you are convinced that there is no way that you could ever love them. And the Bible says, yes, you can if you will, because God will give you what you need to do so. God wants to love them through you. God can enable you to love them with his love. So why not make a list, even mentally? Uh, Make a list of the things you would do for them if you already like them. And then choose to do these things even though you don't feel like it. Because your very decision to love the unlovely will release the Holy Spirit's power in you to produce the fruit of the Spirit of love. Now the third component of agape love has to do with its price tag. It will serve 
no matter what the personal cost. Agape is sacrificial. It gives up whatever it takes to meet the need. Once again, we return to Romans 5.8, only to discover that all three components of agape love are exemplified by God in this one verse. Look again, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ. There's unselfish serving. God did this while we were still sinners. There's the unworthiness of the recipients. And now we see what Jesus did for us when he was sent by God. He died for us. He gave up his life for us. It was the ultimate sacrifice. There's the no matter what the personal cost. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 to imitate God in everything that we do because we are his dear children. Today's Father's Day and I hope you are finding ways to honor your dad but don't forget that you have a heavenly father You are his dear children if you have faith in Jesus Christ, and the best way you can honor your Father up in heaven is to imitate him. How do you do that? You live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. When you show agape love, it will cost you something. I came across an interesting story recently in the book, The Dad, the Family Coach. Dave Simmons reveals that he and his wife have two children, and they've adopted a family motto as a family. Love is action. They're seeking to teach their kids that if you love somebody, you will put it into action. And Simmons and his wife intentionally seek in their daily interactions as a family to show their children what love is all about by being living examples of love in action, reinforcing these loving deeds and by saying the family motto. Remember, kids, love is action. One day, Simmons took his children, his daughter Helen, age 10, and son Brandon, age 7, with him to the local mall to do a little shopping. As they drove up, they spotted in the mall parking lot, right outside the store they planned to enter, a makeshift petting zoo, which consisted of a portable fence and about six inches of sawdust on the parking lot, and about a hundred little furry baby animals of all kinds inside. Kids pay the money, and they stay in the enclosure, enraptured with these squirmy little critters while their moms and dads shop. Daddy, can we go? Can we go? Please, can we go? Sure, he said, and he flipped them both a quarter before walking into the store. A few minutes later, Simmons turned around and saw his daughter, Helen, parked, uh, Helen walking behind him in the store. He found it hard to believe that she preferred the hardware department to the petting zoo, so he bent down and asked her what was wrong. And she looked up her dad and with sad brown eyes and said, well, Daddy, It costs 50 cents to get in, and you only gave us a quarter each, so I gave Brandon my quarter so he could go in. Then she said the most beautiful thing her father had ever heard her say, Daddy, love is action. She had watched her parents show love in action, and now she was incorporated into her lifestyle. She was imitating her father. Simmons writes that Helen's expression of love towards her brother wasn't just love in action. That day, his little girl didn't step and say that love is sacrificial action because no one loves cuddly, furry creatures more than Helen. And giving up her place in the petting zoo, she, she did that so her brother could enjoy it. And what a personal sacrifice that was. Simmons relate what happens next. I thought I knew what would happen next. Because if I was him, I would reach down into the, my pocket and get 50 cents and say, honey, that's great. Go and enjoy the petting zoo. Not what he did. He walked outside with her, and they both stood together outside the fence and watched Brandon go crazy, petting and feeding the animals. Helen stood with her hand and, her ch- and chin resting on the fence and just watched her brother without saying a word. Simmons says, I had 50 cents burning in my pocket. But I never offered it to Helen, and she never asked for it. She wanted to experience the family motto, and I let her. She learned an important truth that day. Love is sacrificial. Love pays a price. Love always costs us something. I want to ask you today, are you agape loving anybody? Are you willing to deny yourself or inconvenience yourself in any way to meet the need of someone else? That's what Christian love is all about. One final point, I'm convinced that we Christians often underestimate the power of agape love, and we're inclined to forget how awesomely attractive it is when others see it or experience it, particularly people outside the faith and outside the church. In the English language, as you see before you, there's a rather neat wordplay going on here, because if you look up the word A-G-A-P-E in the English dictionary, there are two entries. 
The first is the one we've been considering this morning. The dictionary indicates that agape is Christian love or God's love for humanity. However, right after that, there's a second entry, and it's spelled the same, but it's pronounced differently. It's the word agape. And the dictionary definition is this, in a state of wonder and amazement as with the mouth wide open. For instance, if you're watching a powerful display of nature such as an avalanche, you would probably be staring with it, at it with your mouth agape, which means that your mouth would be wide open in awe, and of course, you should close it before it gets full of snow. <laughs> Isn't it interesting, as a coincidence, that mouths wide open in wonder and amazement is the typical reaction when people see or experience God's kind of love? Agape love leaves mouths agape. There was a man who had no interest in spiritual matters, related casually to the Christian neighbor who lived next to him, talked over the back fence, borrowed the lawnmowers and stuff like that. Then the unbeliever's wife was stricken with cancer, and she died a few months later. Here's a part of the letter that this grieving man wrote afterwards. I was in total despair. I went through the funeral preparations and the service like I was in a trance, and after the funeral, I went onto the path along the river, and I walked, and I walked, and I walked all night, but I didn't walk alone because I noticed my neighbor, who must have been afraid for, of me, afraid for me, I guess, stayed with me all night. He didn't speak. He didn't even walk be beside me. He just followed me and watched me, and when the sun finally came up over the river, he came over and said, let's go get some breakfast. I go to church now. I go to my neighbor's church. A religion that can produce that kind of caring and love that my neighbor showed me is something I want to find more about in my life. I want to be loved, and I want to love like that for the rest of my life. Do we realize how powerful love is to draw people to Jesus? The latest issue of the magazine Christianity Today cites a survey done among Muslim people who have converted from Islam to Christian faith. Interesting question. People who used to be in Islam, who grew up in that, who have now embraced Jesus Christ. And they were asked, what was the major factor that caused you to leave your Muslim faith and be drawn to Christianity? 25% cited dreams and visions as the major factor, and God does indeed work sometimes in people where he gives them a dream or a vision and draws them to Christ, 25%. 30% cited disappointment with Islam as a major factor. They came to Christ just because of their disappointment with their, their own religion. 85%, 85% said it was the love of Christians that was the major factor that drew them to the Christian faith. And 60% of the people said the love of Christians was the exclusive factor that drew them to the Christian faith. We all have people living all around us, working in the next cubicle over from us at work, riding the exercise bike or walking the treadmill at, next to us at the health club. They come from different countries, different religions, and we may be tempted to think that they're so steeped and entrenched in their religion and they would never have any interest in coming to Jesus. And do we realize what a little love would do to draw them? If they saw the beauty of Jesus in us and the way that we conducted ourselves towards them, who knows what God could do this Friday night here at Village Church, there is going to be an international workers outreach. We're hosting it. We're not putting it on, but we are hosting it. It's a welcome picnic for Six Flags summer employees who come from other nations. Did you know there are over 300 nations represented at the work site over at Six Flags? I mean, we send missionaries all over the world to reach people for Jesus, and there's 300 nations right over here across the street. And there is a group of visionary Christians who said, let's love them with the love of Jesus. They provide various activities for them to do when they're off duty. A lot of them just work and go back to the dorm. And they love to, to have some contact with American people. There's going to be a picnic here on Friday night. People from the Dominican Republic and Jamaica and Taiwan and Thailand and Singapore and Turkey are going to be here. 
don't know Jesus, there are going to be people here showing them Christ's love. Last year, this event took place here as well, and there was a young woman from China who gave her life to the Lord. She was so ripe, she was ready to receive Jesus that night. Don't underestimate the power of Christian love. I want to close this message today by sharing with you a wonderful story of how God is at work right here at Village Church. In the wake of a tragedy that was recently experienced by a VCG family, the Harveys. Many of you know that Anna Harvey, the 30-something daughter of Steve and Kathy Harvey, a single mom with two young daughters, Kiara and Shoshana, Anna was tragically killed out on Highway 45 in early May. She was riding her bicycle home from a class at CLC when she was accidentally struck by a car and died at the scene. You can imagine the pain and grief the Harvey family have experienced due to this huge loss. And in the providence of God, a woman named Karen came up to the scene of the accident even before the emergency personnel did. She got out of her vehicle and went over to where Anna was lying on the road, and she held Anna in her arms as Anna passed away. While Steve and Kathy were here at church in my office a few days later to plan the funeral, they didn't know about this event, a call came into the church office here from this kind woman who had been with Anna in the end. She had somehow found out that the Harveys were from a part of Village Church, and she wanted to inform them anonymously that Anna was not alone when she died, so she called the church, not realizing that the Harveys were here right then. She didn't leave her name, so you ask, how do I know her name was Karen? Well, in a newspaper article about the accident a few days later, Kathy, Anna's mom, spoke of this stranger who came to Anna at the end and wished that she could meet her and thank her. And Karen saw that article, so she called Kathy, and they arranged a meeting. And in their time together, Kathy led Karen to the Lord. Yeah. Karen later told me that she had not been particularly religious or seeking God and hardly ever prayed. But when she arrived at the scene of the accident and got out of her car to be with Anna, she consciously sensed the presence of God and felt compelled to pray as never before in her life. Karen now realizes that she was there that day on Highway 45 by divine appointment, that God had brought her there not only to be with Anna, but because God wanted Karen to find God. Karen is now growing in her new faith in Christ with Kathy's guidance and encouragement, and Karen has been attending BCG since Mother's Day. In fact, she may be here. Karen, are you here in this service? Right here. Welcome to Village Church, Karen. Not only welcome to Village Church, but welcome to the family of God. As you know now, God is real. And he has this uncanny ability to bring good things out of tragedy. But that's not the end of the story. God has been marvelously at work in other ways through the Harvey's Christian faith and love. Kathy found out that the young man driving the car that hit her daughter Anna was a believer, as was his parents. Kathy contacted them just a short time after the accident and realized how weighed down with pain and guilt they were. So Kathy invited this young man and his parents to meet with Steve, her husband, and her and Anna's two daughters, Kiara and Shoshana. The meeting was arranged for here at Village Church, and it just took place this past week, delayed in part because the attorneys on both sides were a little hesitant. (laughs) But the meeting came to be, and each of the lawyers came to witness it. I had the privilege of hosting and leading the meeting that took place last Wednesday evening, and I can tell you that the love and the grace of God was saturating that room in a special way. As these two Christian families gathered around the same table, and after some introductions, the young man tearfully read a letter to the Harveys, expressing how sorry he was. I'll never forget, he looked at the two little girls, and he said, I'm so sorry. No children should have to bury their mother. I hope that you will forgive me. I've asked God to forgive me, and I I think he has, but I have a hard time forgiving myself. Please forgive me. No sooner had he gotten done reading the letter that 
Kathy, on behalf of the family, said, we forgive you. We forgive you. And then she proceeded to read a letter on behalf of the family that she had written, expressing, their, expressing the fact that they knew it was an accident, expressing the fact that they were not angry or bitter, and they didn't want this young man or his family to continue to carry the weight of any guilt. And Kathy shared with them several good things that she had already seen God do as a result of this tragedy, including the spiritual awake, awakening of Karen. She says, God is good. He's at work. And then Kathy presented the family a beautiful vase of flowers with various kinds of flowers in it. She had done some research, and each flower symbolized some aspect of the message that she wanted to convey to this family. Some flowers represented love, and others forgiveness, and others healing, and others innocence. And as these flowers were received, and as the copies of the letters were exchanged, there wasn't a dry eye in the room, including those of the lawyers who, by the way, whose mouths were agape. (laughs) They had just witnessed something they weren't used to seeing and were awestruck with the power of Christian love. Had the opportunity after the meeting to talk with the attorneys. Was able to point out to them that what they had just seen and what they had just heard was only because of Jesus. That these two families were simply passing along to each other some of the love and grace that Jesus had lavishly given them. Folks, when you're in the presence of agape, you know that you are in the presence of God. May the Spirit of the Lord, therefore, produce this distinctively Christian fruit in all of us. And may the awesome power of agape love not only leave mouths agape, but also cause searching hearts in lost people all around us to open wide to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me as I close in prayer? Lord, we embrace the truth today that the fruit of the Spirit is first and foremost love. And God, we pray that by your Holy Spirit who lives within us as Christ's followers will flood our hearts with your love so that it will spill over into the lives of other people. Lord, I pray on behalf of Village Church that this Friday night the love of Jesus will be all over this place as Christians gather with Six Flags workers and seek to get to know them and, and, and show the love of Christ. God, whether people come to Christ right away or whether they just simply gain a new appreciation and impressive um, experience with Christians, God, we pray that you will be at work and draw people to yourself. God, I want to pray for the dads in this room today on this Father's Day. Hopefully they'll be honored today and maybe even receive a gift or two. But God, I pray that you will help the dads of Village Church to give gifts to their wife, to their children, gifts of agape love. God, would you cause the men of this congregation to step up and be living examples of agape love, which is powerful and strong, not weak. God, I pray that there will be such agape love in our lives that our children will look at us and say, I want to be like Dad, because he's like my Heavenly Father. Indeed, I pray for every person here at Village Church, and I pray for us as a congregation. God, more and more, may Village Church be a place that agape love flows, a place where agape love spills over into the community, and others are drawn to Jesus. God, I pray that you will help us to live a life of love even this week so that mouths will be agape. People will be awestruck by the power and attractiveness of the love of Jesus that's flowing in our lives. We pray over the remainder of this summer as week by week we study different aspects of how we love you and love others that you will grow this fruit in our lives. To your honor and glory we pray. And all of God's people at Village Church say amen and amen. God bless you.
That is not.